Today's talk by Dr. Felicia Cornblu is part of the IHC's year-long public event series, Social Securities. Felicia Cornblu is Associate Professor of History and Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Vermont and former director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Before coming to UVM, she taught at Duke University, having received her MA and PhD from Princeton and her BA from Harvard Radcliffe College. Cornwall was former president of United Academics, a local branch of the American Federation of Teachers and the American Association of University Professors Collective Bargaining Congress. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England and Vice President of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America Vermont Action Fund. She is co-author with Gwendolyn Mink of Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform in Feminist Perspective, which appeared in 2018, and of The Battle for Welfare Rights, Poverty and Politics in Modern America. Presently, she's at work on two books. How to Win a War on Women, My Mother, wait, How to Win a War on Women, My Mother, Her Neighbor, and the Fate of Reproductive Rights and Justice in Modern America, and an essay collection entitled Constant Craving Economic Justice in Modern America. Carl Lewis essays on topics in the history of law in the United States since 1945 and the history of poverty have appeared in the American Historical Review. Journal of American History, Feminist Studies, Radical History Review, Labor Law and Social Inquiry, and many other journals, as well as in the New York Times, the LA Times, The Nation, In These Times, and the Women's Review of Books. Cornblue began her activist and advocacy work while in high school, where she directed the children's advocacy and journalism organization, Children's Express. <laughs> she later worked for the United States House Select Committee on Children, Youth, and Families, and she held a leadership role in the Women's Committee of 100, a network of feminist writers and scholars committed to the proposition that, quote, a war against poor women is a war against all women. I am delighted that Felicia Cornblue is here to speak with us today. I want to extend sincere thanks to the co-sponsors of today's event, the Blum Center for Global Poverty Alleviation and Sustainable Development, and the whole chair in Feminist Studies. Thank you. And I now ask that you please join me in welcoming Felicia Cornwell to give her talk, Why Can't Feminists Change the Law? The History and Politics of Welfare Reform in the Modern U.S. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, oh, especially thank you to my, my old friends, Alice O'Connor and Eileen Boris for co-sponsoring the event and for being so gracious about having me here. Um, I have done a lot of edits on this uh, in the last several days, so I am looking a little bit uh, through my papers. Just bear with me. I will find the place if I need to. Um, but uh, you can, you know, maybe take some uh, solace from the fact that um, even after writing two books, sometimes I still need to find my place. Okay. <clears throat> well, in, a study, in a study published in February 2015, researchers found that the 1996 welfare reform law shortens women's lives. Scholars studying two states compared the old pre-reform welfare program with the later one and discovered that the policy authorized by the statute called the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or as I will call it here, PRWORA, shortened recipients' lives by nearly six months. It also saved the governments approximately 28,000 per recipient over her lifetime. An earlier study by the same research group found that in Florida alone, the death rate for participants in the post-1996 welfare, welfare program was 16% higher than for people who had received welfare in earlier decades. Um, now this one bit of data was the starting point for this book. The first thing that I wrote on this project, um, Ensuring Poverty, was a paragraph about this data. And what struck me about it was that it was a clear piece of evidence that, um, that had a, a clear social science positive result. Um, and, it, uh, and it addressed something of great urgency, that the government had instituted a policy that, in effect, was shortening women's lives. Um, and yet, 
the moment when these findings were published was exactly the same moment as the Benghazi hearings on Capitol Hill, in which the US Congress was calling Hillary Clinton back again and again to rehearse the same set of facts and discuss again the things that had gone wrong uh, with the State Department policy in Benghazi that had led uh, to some deaths over there. And uh, I kept contrasting the amount of attention that the media and the political system were paying to that series of events with the amount of attention that they were paying to this series of events, which was virtually nil. So that was the start of writing this book. Um, the book, Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform and Feminist Perspective, which I co-authored with political scientist Gwendolyn Mink, is an effort to explain how we as a nation ended up with a policy that promotes the death of mothers. Um, in, in writing Ensuring Poverty, what Nick and I were trying to explore was the law's impact, but also why it has thus far been so stubbornly resistant to change. Our book chronicles the contested history of welfare reform, including often forgotten alternative arguments that were advanced by feminists, and proposals for initiatives that actually would have helped mothers achieve independence for themselves and security for their families, as opposed to, in effect, killing them. Um, we assess policy debates in an arena that's often been treated as one of regnant consensus, examining voices that have been engaged as well as those that have not been heard. We argue that the origins of the 1996 welfare law and the unwillingness of politicians in response to its evident failures to repeal it or transform it must be understood in terms of gender. And when we say gender, we mean it the way uh, those of us in the feminist academy mean it. Gender that encompasses devastating stereotypes about men and masculinity as well as women and femininity. Gender, a stubborn archetype of binary roles that doesn't acknowledge more than two options and has little to do with the way many people live. And gender as experienced by manifestly heterogeneous real people at the power clog intersections to which Kimberly Williams Crenshaw called our attention almost 30 years ago when she coined the term intersectionality and especially at the intersection known as what our colleague Eileen Boris has named racialized gender. In fact, welfare reform to us represents a kind of ideal case study for scholars of intersectional gender and public policy. Conventional left-right politics fail, we argue, to capture what has gone wrong in the life of this particular public policy as our colleagues such as Louise Laquant at Berkeley, Joel Handler and C. Hasenfeld and Sanford Schramm and Joe Soss have all argued, PRWORA was indeed part of what we might call a neoliberal capitulation to the low-wage labor market by a Republican Congress and by Bill Clinton's White House in the 1990s. It was of a piece with the so-called new Democrats, that is the conservative Democrats represented by Bill Clinton, with their advocacy of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and their insistence on balanced budgets. However, the political economic commitments of New Democrats, like President Bill Clinton, who signed this legislation after the Republicans wrote it, um, those commitments explain some aspects of the statute, like its inclusion of mandatory work, but they don't explain other aspects of the law, like its emphasis on stereotype norms of sexual, romantic, and parental behavior. Only, we argue, a robust theory of intersectional racialized gender can explain the central place of these norms um, in this arena of public policy. So, our uh, aims in the book are three. First, I'm going to do a lot of listing, a lot of, a lot of things come in threes, so bear, bear with that. Um, first, we aim to bring the understanding of what we sometimes, sometimes call intersectional sexism to the study of modern public policy in the United States both inside and outside universities. Second, we want to encourage our colleagues in the Feminist Academy, in particular, to engage in the study of public policy more persistently and tenaciously than we typically do. And then third, Mink and I hope that our work will broaden how the public talks about the safety net and welfare justice, and indeed about the history and the future of all public policy in the United States. Um, in case it's not already obvious, let me just hasten to note that ensuring poverty is not a neutral treatment of this history. Um, although, in my view, it is an honest one. Gwendolyn Mink 
Wink and I have been working together um, as advocates on issues of social welfare for about 25 years. Uh, we met in 19, probably more than some of you have been online, maybe? <laughs> All right, I won't think about that for too long. Um, we met in 1993 working together on issues of welfare reform um, at a panel that was organized by Gwendolyn Mink's late mother, the Congresswoman Patsy T. Mink, the uh, Democrat of Hawaii. Um, and Patsy Mink's manuscript collection from the Library of Congress is our main archival source for the book. Gwendolyn Mink and I were both members of the Women's Committee of 100, as was already mentioned, a coalition of writers and scholars who opposed the proposals that ultimately became PRWORA. We lobbied Congress to stop the proposals before they became law, and then again at the turn of the 21st century, we lobbied Congress in behalf of what we thought would be a better feminist alternative. Our book then is in part a chronicle and assessment of our own political efforts, as well as those of my co-author's beloved late mother. So the remainder of the talk will proceed in three parts. First, uh, I will talk about the main features of PRWORA and summarize our uh, analysis of the statute. And please, if there's any part of that that um, you don't catch or that is unclear, um, just make a note and we'll talk about it uh, during the Q&A. Um, second, I'll talk uh, in greater depth about the efforts that we made as feminists to rewrite that 1996 law when it was eligible for reauthorization in 2001-2002. And um, in that section, section, I'll focus on two texts. Um, one of them, a policy proposal and statement of feminist philosophy by the Women's Committee of 100 that was titled, and again, <laughs> I think Boris is pointing at herself, because I believe she was one of the original signatories of this document. Uh, so you might want to talk, talk to her already. <laughs> talk to her as well. Um, the proposal was called an immodest proposal called Rewarding Women's Work to End Poverty. Um, and then the second text is a piece of legislation that Representative Mink introduced into the House of Representatives as an alternative to PRWORA, and this was known as HR 3113. Um, HR 3113 became the main progressive democratic bill for welfare reauthorization, um, and it garnered a lot of support before being dropped by the Democratic leadership of the House of Representatives before it came up for a vote. And then third, I'll offer some answers to the question that was provocatively posed in the title of the talk, why can't, or at any rate, why couldn't feminists change the law? So, okay, first, P-R-W-O-R-A. Um, the, the law is a multi-part statute. Um, it's complicated and there's a lot going on in it, but I'll just run through some of the major, um, the major aspects of it. Um, and there are, I think, that, I think this comes in four parts this time, yeah, four parts. Um, so the first thing about PRWRA and the program it created called Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, or TANF, um, is that it eliminated what had been an entitlement to aid for low-income mothers and children. Um, and what that means is that it went from being a program in which when people needed it, the money would, be, would simply be available, um, as it is, for example, with uh, the SNAP program, or what we used to call food stamps, and with Medicaid, when people need to get their health care through Medicaid. Uh, so it went from an entitlement in which the money would be available if people met the eligibility criteria of the federal government and their own state, and so on. Um, it went from that to being a block grant. So the federal government gives the states, uh, has given since 1996, a set amount of money and no more. The money does not increase if need increases, except under certain rare circumstances, right? So it went from an entitlement to being a block grant. And then the other aspect of it no longer being entitlement is that each individual who uh, applies for or receives this kind of support, low-income moms and kids mostly, um, faces a five-year lifetime limit on the time when they can receive any assistance, an absolute five-year limit across their whole lifetime. And the law explicitly says to the states that if they want to give money for more time than that, they're not allowed to um, with federal money, um, at least with federal dollars. But if they want to drop that number down and give people support for less time than that, then they're explicitly permitted to do that. Right? So that's the first big piece of it, eliminated the entitlement. 
And the lack of entitlement is sort of implied in this language. There used to be a program called Aid to, De to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, that was created under Roosevelt in the New Deal period. After 1996, the name changes to Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, T-A-N-F, right? The temporary being the key aspect of that. So that's number one. Second is that there's mandatory work, um, again, with some exceptions. Um, the states must require work on the part of people who receive this aid, um, and if people don't participate in work, then the state must sanction them. Uh, and most states uh, apply what are called full family sanctions. So if the parent, again, typically a mother, um, doesn't work or if she uh, falls afoul of the rules in some other way, her entire family loses their assistance, including their kids. Quote, unquote, full family sanctions. And also along with that mandatory work, it used to be that people could receive under welfare um, fairly good um, educations, right? They could pursue education, and that would count as part of the work that they were doing under the welfare programs. After 96, that opportunity for work was actually collapsed and cut dramatically. So now you can um, do vocational training only, no more education than that, no more education than that, and for a maximum of 12 months, right? Again, you know, with certain exceptions, but that's the, that's the basic thing. Uh, also, even though people are mandated to go into work, there's no guarantee of child care, right? There's no entitlement to child care any more than there is an entitlement to uh, general assistance, to, to cash assistance. So those are two big aspects of it. Then, in terms of gender in particular and people's reproductive rights, um, the law expressly allows the states um, to impose what's called a family cap. Um, and uh, that was, it was very controversial at the time the law was passed. In fact, some uh, state appellate courts had said that it was unconstitutional to impose such a family cap. What that's uh, because of uh, concerns about people's privacy and reproductive rights. What that says is that if you are receiving uh, public assistance, welfare assistance, and you have an additional child while you're receiving the money, you get no additional money for the additional child. So in effect, each kid gets less. Right, that's the quote unquote family cap. And it's an attempt by the government to sort of coerce people to have fewer children, right? Um, at least not to, not to procreate while poor, <laughs> we could say. No, no procreation while poor. Um, uh, the law also uh, increased uh, child support guidelines dramatically uh, and was suffused with rhetoric about low income men and fathers um, calling them quote unquote deadbeat dads and kind of pushing them. Uh, even into the prison system when they were unable to pay child support. And then the last thing that's really important on gender, or on gender lines, and this is a little bit of a silver lining, I call it a tarnished silver lining, um, is there was a family violence option added to the law. Um, and that means that if uh, you can be proven to be a victim of domestic violence, your state may, they don't have to, but they may excuse you from some of these rules and guidelines. So it's only an option. Uh, for people who are victims of family violence. Okay, so those are the, the first big three. And then the last thing I'll just mention is that this law, even though it was signed by a Democratic president, it actually was very um, consequential in terms of the negative treatment of immigrants. And for the first time in this law, uh, people who were documented, not just undocumented immigrants, but also documented people who were not U.S. citizens, were forbidden from receiving major public benefits. And that was an absolute for, forbid um, originally, and it's been moderated. So now if you, uh, you have to have been in the country for five years as a documented person before you can receive any assistance, even non-cash assistance, like uh, child care, education, or something, um, under this program. Democrats. OK. Uh, so those are some of the major features of the law, uh, which of course we can talk more about. Uh, as a result of its uh, many defects, uh, this PRWORA and this program it created called TANF um, uh, didn't do much to mitigate women's poverty, uh, and in fact, uh, poverty is held steady among single mother families. At the time we were drafting the book, we discovered that um, the poverty rate overall for, for single mother uh, families was 36% for African American single mother families, 39%. 41% for families headed by Latinas, 43% for Native American female-headed families, and 42% for 
for families headed by foreign-born women, and I'm sure that the last number in particular is an undercount. Um, despite the persistence of this poverty, welfare reform has become a model for other public assistance programs in the United States. Um, the main features of the law, including its work requirements and its surveillance of recipients, family behavior, and sexual behavior, have been exported to other programs, as you might have noticed. Um, we see these things in the SNAP program, the anti hunger program, uh, and even in public housing. Uh, recently, the Trump administration has, by administrative fiat, allowed the states to add work requirements to the Medicaid health insurance program. Uh, congressional Republicans attempted just weeks ago to stiffen the work requirements in the SNAP program. Uh, in our book, we talk at length about the history of welfare reform in modern America and about, about the origins of the PRWRA statute. But I'm going to uh, jump ahead a little bit and pick up the story a few years later at the moment when this law was eligible for reauthorization. Uh, the welfare reform law was uh, going to expire in October of 2002. And as the deadline approached, familiar mantras about the moral priority of wage work and marriage guided mainstream Republicans and Democrats both. Members of the Women's Committee of 100 were prepared. We, that is a group, including Wendell Mink and myself, um, although uh, she was more closely involved than I was at this point, we had begun discussing TANF reauthorization in 1999. We saw TANF as degrading and oppressive to low-income single mothers, disproportionately women of color, who were caught in the vise of meeting work requirements while also shouldering full-time responsibility for their kids. We wanted to restore the support for single parents' caregiving work that was provided by the old welfare system before 1996. We also understood uh, TANF to be inseparable from other perils to women's reproductive rights and to all people's autonomy in their sexual, romantic, and parenting activities. And we were worried um, that if they were preserved in the TANF statute and not challenged, the stereotypes that had shaped the welfare reform of the 90s would bedevil all of our future efforts to support low-income workers and caregivers. So we offered what we called an immodest proposal that broadened the conversation about reauthorizing welfare to propose replacing quote-unquote temporary assistance to needy families with a much more reliable form of income support for families. In place of a maximum of five years of support, we called for a caregiver's allowance with no time limit. Um, and this wasn't a crazy thing. It was modeled on an existing program, which is survivor's insurance under Social Security, which provides income to the children of deceased workers, as well as to their surviving spouses, while the surviving spouses are raising kids. Uh, recipients of survivor's insurance get benefits that are federally rather than locally administered, and so the availability of this kind of assistance uh, doesn't depend on, depend on the fiscal or budgetary whims of an individual state. Uh, benefit levels don't fluctuate with the election cycle. In addition to being reliable and regular, survivor's insurance has always been much more generous than welfare has been. Unlike welfare recipients, survivors under this program aren't subject to regulation, surveillance, and sanctions in exchange for their benefits. Uh, members of the Women's Committee of 100 drew on our own research to create a proposal that recognized the time and energy it takes to care for family and community members. Quote, women perform the bulk of caring work for children, elders, and dependent persons, the Amaz proposal reminded people. Uh, our statement underlined the fact that, quote, our economic system undervalues caregiving when it's performed in the labor market, and it penalizes caregivers when they work outside the labor market, unquote. We insisted that because, quote, poverty in the United States is not colorblind, unquote, public policy must resolve to end the racialized, gendered distribution of poverty and inequality. Our proposal demanded respect for the work mostly women do, um, not exclusively women, in caring for their families. It also recognized the participation of many women in waged work. Uh, quote, to replace TANF, we wrote, we propose a set of policies that allow women and other caregivers to choose between performing the caregiving themselves, unquote, and finding professionals who can offer substitute care. 
So uh, in 2000, the year 2000, we circulated this proposal and made it accessible on our website and uh, started to develop specific ideas for legislation on that basis. But welfare reform was kind of a back burner issue during the whole year of 2000, um, and it wasn't much discussed even during the presidential election that year. In fact, there was a lot of agreement between mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans about how welfare reform had been such a great success. Um, and so we really didn't have a debate about it. Uh, it was only after George W. Bush entered the White House in early 2001 that uh, the debate over reauthorization started to really heat up. Um, and everybody who was involved in this debate benefited from the fact that we had new social science data to go on as well uh, in that period. Um, there was a whole set of social science research done about the people who left the welfare rolls when they were kind of timed off or when they were forced off the welfare rolls, um, and, uh, and about uh, levels of poverty and so on. Um, so people who were in favor of welfare reform, the boosters, uh, the key thing they pointed to was the fact that the number of people getting welfare, uh, the caseload, as people call it, had gone down dramatically. And that was true. By 2001, PANF caseloads had declined almost by half as compared to the old AFDC program. However, people who found welfare reform more problematic uh, found in that data uh, that the people who were receiving aid actually did not match the stereotypes that had been used um, in the passage of the welfare reform law. These were not large families. It wasn't people having 10 kids. Um, and they weren't teenage moms, for the most part. The average size of a tenant family was three, usually a parent and two children. The parent's average age was 32. Moreover, people who were leaving the welfare rolls were still in great, great economic need, for the most part. Um, uh, one a summary of lots of different local studies that were done of people who left the welfare rolls found that there were two main reasons why people stopped receiving benefits. One was that they got work, and so maybe those people were no longer in desperate poverty. But the other reason was that people were dropped from the rolls because they broke the rules. Um, sometimes in uh, history of political science, we call that bureaucratic disentitlement. Right? They still actually needed help, but they could no longer get it because of a bureaucratic rule that they had run afoul of. Um, of the people that worked for wages, um, the average hourly compensation was between $5.50 and $8.80 per hour, even accounting for um, changes in the cost of living since then. Um, the Congressional Research Service concluded that we still had, quote, a significant number of people who were below the poverty line. In self-reports, approximately half of former welfare recipients said that, quote, food did not last, or they did not have money for food at some time in the past year, either often or at least sometimes, quote. So conservatives weren't too worried about that, conservative Republicans at least. Um, they thought, reading those data, that what they needed to do was uh, promote marriage more for low-income people. They thought that was the solution to poverty. And they wanted to drive people even more into the labor market. Although the original PRWORA law had declared heterosexual marriage, quote, the foundation of a successful society, unquote, the conservative critics said the government hadn't invested enough in trying to promote marriage among poor people. Um, so, for example, Robert Rector from the Heritage Foundation argued in congressional testimony that TANF hurt families by promoting, quote, destructive Let's norms take and US values. One south. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. um, and he argued further that, quote, illegitimacy was passed like a virus between generations, quote, that mothers who received TANF were, quote, sitting idly on the rolls, unquote and that Congress could comfortably cut the federal tenant appropriation by 10% without causing any harm. Um, in the Democratic mainstream, the legacy of the Bill Clinton administration, <laughs> um, the legacy of the Bill Clinton administration um, and its endorsement of this law tempered opposition to these kinds of Republican arguments. So you find even uh, Democrats, mainstream Democrats in this period, who continue to also say that the solution to women's poverty is marriage or greater labor market participation. And so um, here's only one example. I have several in the book. Um, C. Eugene Sturl, who was a senior fellow of the liberal-leaning Urban Institute, admitted in congressional testimony that there was no research to support the idea 
that tweaking the anti-poverty programs would reverse long-term trends in people's marriage behavior or their sexual behavior. However, he said, quote, independently from whether they would significantly affect behavior in a narrow sense, unquote, he still thought that the government should pursue those policies. So just you know, think about that for a second. He's saying it's not going to work. Right? <laughs> it's not going to change people's marriage patterns, and it's not really going to make them any less poor. Um, however, we should do it anyway, because marriage is good. That's the, Democrat, the mainstream Democratic uh, position. OK. Um, against, uh, against the tide of this kind of Democratic thinking, as well as Republican thinking, Congresswoman Patsy T. Mink drafted a proposal for TANF reauthorization in consultation with Gwendolyn Mink and members of the Women's Committee of 100. Um, her bill, H.R. 3113, was comprehensive legislation that mirrored in its scope, uh, in its wide scope, the PRWORA legislation that it was meant to replace. It was somewhat less ambitious than the Women's Committee of 100's proposal, um, but Mink was expressly trying to be strategic politically and trying to introduce legislation that would seem like a reform of the existing law instead of like an effort to sort of burn the old law down and start all over again. However, basically, uh, in terms of her philosophical approach, uh, she was in the same place as the Women's Committee of 100, believing that um, if the government was going to demand certain obligations of low-income moms um, and other parents, um, that it also had an obligation to ensure their, that they would have a minimally decent family life whether or not they were earning a lot in the labor market, whether or not they were married. So the Mink Bill, H.R. 3113, it eliminated that five-year maximum on benefits and the restrictions that PRWORA imposed on uh, documented immigrants' eligibility for assistance. And it required all of the states to address domestic and sexual violence, right? Not an option anymore. Uh, but something states had to do. The Ming Bill asserted the personhood rights of poor mothers, including their reproductive and their parental rights. Among other things, it repealed the family cap. Um, among its explicit purposes was support for family caregivers and children, uh, of children. Uh, it counted care for a child under six or for a sick or disabled child of any age as a kind of work, a valuable kind of work that would fulfill somebody's work it reduced the required hours per week of work outside the home for family caregivers where they could not access quality, affordable, and accessible child care. And it also restored the guarantee of child care that had been included in uh, many welfare proposals in the old days before 1996, but that the 96 law had effectively canceled. The main bill um, nominally preserved the five-year maximum, but then uh, it stopped the clock for most people who would be receiving benefits. Parents of young and disabled children were not subject to the time limit, for example, and the clock uh, didn't run. In other words, the five-year clock just didn't run as long as participants were following the program's rules. If they were raising children or working in the labor market, pursuing education, or addressing their barriers to employment. The clock stopped. So once it was introduced, this bill um, gained a lot of political traction um, and was probably more successful than veterans of the Bill Clinton uh, White House would ever have predicted. It became the feminist progressive alternative to the Bush White House's proposal. Um, and it garnered support from the Congressional Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and the Progressive Caucus, all of which rallied around the bill. The original co-sponsors were, uh, for the most part, feminist women, disproportionately feminists of color, such as Representatives Barbara Lee and Hilda Solis. Um, but by early in 2002, the bill had picked up support for many Democrats, including white liberals like Representative George Miller from Northern California, who I worked for once upon a time, um, and independent Bernie Sanders from Vermont, um, who was then a member of the House of Representatives before he went to the Senate. By the end of April 2002, the bill had 93 co-sponsors. And it also had the support of 91 organizations from outside the Congress, um, everybody from the American Civil Liberties Union to the YWCA. 
However, even though ultimately 44% of the House Democratic Caucus co-sponsored this bill, and there were all those outside groups, the Democratic Party leadership in the House ultimately chose to offer a much more conservative bill. Um, their dem the Democratic substitute that they ultimately endorsed didn't notice or attempt to correct the sex and gender aspects of TANF. Um, it didn't address the racial disparities in the program. Um, and while it did uh, seek opportunities for welfare moms to prepare for jobs with good wages, it did not acknowledge the caregiving work that parents perform when they raise children. Um, this official Democratic substitute was introduced by a conservative Democrat named Representative Ben Cardin from Maryland, um, who was then the ranking member of the subcommittee that had jurisdiction over the TANF program. Um, ultimately, the only people who didn't support the Cardin bill, this conservative Democratic bill, were Representative Mink herself and members of the Congressional Black Caucus. In the end, Gwendolyn Mink, Nancy Mink's daughter, wrote dispiritedly to Jacqueline Payne of the now Legal Defense Fund, who's a key advocate from outside Congress, saying, quote, our effort at a, quote, tri-caucus protest among the black, Hispanic, and progressive caucuses has turned into a Patsy plus black caucus final march. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and she named some of the key advocates, Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas, Maxine Waters from California, and Major Owens from New York, and Patsy Mink. They all went to Democratic Majority Leader Richard Gephardt and begged him to support H.R. 3113. He told them, essentially, that it's more important to hold on to the new Democrats, that is, the conservative Democrats, than to accommodate progressives and people of color." Unquote. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, it, 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 <laughs> um, it was kind of, a, kind of an important moment, I think. Um, in the Senate, uh, where the Democrats actually had a majority, although it was a slim majority, um, there was never a compliment, a feminist bill that was uh, an equivalent of Patsy Mink's bill. There was only one proposal introduced by Senator Patty Murray that raised the issue of valuing familial caregiving, and it was not widely embraced by others in the Chamber's Democratic Caucus. Um, the Senate Finance Committee, which on that side of the Congress had jurisdiction over this legislation, produced a bill that was quite conservative, um, a far cry from Patsy Mink's bill, and actually more like the bill that came out of the George W. Bush White House. Um, the Senate Finance Committee accommodated a lot of the gender and family agenda that at one time was associated with the so-called moral majority within the Republican Party. Um, they included what were called, quote, healthy marriage promotion programs. Um, trying to get poor people to get married, again. 75% um, of which, uh, the cost of which would be paid by the federal government, plus publicly subsidized, quote, abstinence education, um, and a variety of initiatives to promote, quote, responsible fatherhood. It did not make the family violence option mandatory on the states. Um, and other Democratic uh, senators um, weren't actually too far away from the Finance Committee on these issues. Even Senator Patty Murray didn't try and make the family violence option into a mandate or fight the rhetoric about quote-unquote deadbeat dads and the roles of fathers. Um, the fatherhood bandwagon in particular seemed to have momentum among Democrats. Uh, Senators Hillary Clinton, Bob Graham, and Joseph Lieberman asked Finance Committee Chairman Max Baucus to focus even more than he already had on, quote, male responsibility and male employment, unquote. Um, given the Democrats' bare majority in the Senate and the looming election in 2002 that um, ultimately would tip the balance toward the GOP in the Senate, um, ultimately what happened was there was no welfare bill that made it out of the United States Senate that year. And so officially, if not actually, the welfare law expired on September 30th, 2002. Congress did an end run, and they prolonged the program through a series of short-term continuing resolutions that left the funding levels and requirements unchanged. Um, the stalemate actually went on and on, and they wound up having to pass 10 different continuing resolutions to keep this program kind of on life support. Um, 
But finally, in 2006, uh, the Democrats gave in and uh, finally allowed a vote on this TANF reform, uh, which basically followed the Republican playbook. Um, TANF reauthorization, as it finally happened, made work requirements more onerous. It made marriage promotion, what we call in the book, a malevolent boondoggle. Um, that's part of the not very objective part of the baby. <laughs> we call it a malevolent boondoggle. Um, and it gave states latitude to redirect funds uh, away from cash assistance for poor people and into a whole range of services provided by public and private, secular and church-based organizations. So, uh, last part of the talk. Why can't feminists change the law? <laughs> or looking at this case in particular, why couldn't feminists change the law this time? Um, as we've seen, it wasn't because they didn't have the data. It wasn't because they lacked a public philosophy. Or that they failed to turn that philosophy into a practical <coughs> legislative initiative. That was HR 3113. I think it was because we feminist welfare reformers were trying to participate in a public sphere that had long been starved of important feminist ideas. And Gwendolyn Mink and I focus in the book on the two ideas of intersectionality and reproductive justice. Um, both of these terms call our attention to the different ways that gender hierarchy is experienced by people with diverse histories, identities, and characteristics. Reproductive justice, in particular, um, calls our attention to the realms of childbearing and parenting, demanding that feminists expand the pro-choice movement to include what it would actually take to ensure the choice to parent, as well as the choice to avoid parenting. Now, Everybody here might understand what we mean when we use these academic terms, intersectionality and reproductive justice. But I guarantee you, the number of people in Washington, D.C. policy circles who would know what we're talking about <laughs> is infinitesimally small. And I don't think that even a lot of feminists today who have a mass audience People like, say, Sheryl Sandberg, who wrote that book, Lean In, right? Or the, the pop feminists, the celebrity feminists, who have a gazillion Twitter followers, right? I don't think they're speaking this language either. And they may not really know what we're talking about either. One thing I learned from lobbying with the Women's Committee of 100 was that even liberal and women legislators seemed not to understand the challenge that ideas like intersectionality and reproductive justice actually pose to their familiar ways of doing business. For example, when I argued that defending welfare was integral to the feminist agenda, one powerful female legislator suggested that being pro-choice and female was plenty feminist enough for her. She and other holders of political power simply hadn't kept up with feminist activism and knowledge production, and I'm sure it was quite convenient for them, in a sense, not to keep up. Right, so I think this is where we all come in. It's our job to blaze and then to walk many trails between the academy and the arenas where public policy is made. We need to up our game in public policy studies, as practiced at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. We need to follow uh, people like Professor Alice O'Connor and Professor Eileen Boris in expanding the conversation in the field of policy history. We need to follow people like my colleague Lori Kalman and Professor Emerita at UCSD Jane DeHart, who have been bringing urgent modern concerns to legal history and legal studies. And we need to participate as educated people in the world outside the academy. Right? A lot of the trails that we're going to blaze will end at the door of the State House or the county government and not at the halls of Congress or the White House. That's appropriate. The, da the daily experiences of low-income parents and children are shaped by layer upon layer of state, county, city, and even neighborhood level public policy. And each of those levels is potentially a place where outsiders with expertise and passion can make a difference. Um, in my home region in northern New England, the population is fairly small, <laughs> and the state governments are relatively accessible, so I've had an opportunity to uh, engage in some activism of this kind at the state level. Uh, so one effort, I'll just give you a couple examples. One thing that I've had the opportunity to do is to be part of a statewide coalition that's going on right now in Vermont 
to raise the level of the TANF grant so that it at least comes within shouting distance of the poverty level. Right now, it's much lower than the poverty line. Right, and also to ensure that my state actually uses the money it gets for welfare on alleviating the poverty of low-income families and children. Right now, that money's not being necessarily used for that purpose. Right, and then at the regional level, um, um, as Susan said, I am on the Board of Trustees of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, and I'm right in the teeth right now of an internal process within Planned Parenthood of talking about what is reproductive justice, right, and what would it actually mean for us to take on the challenge of reproductive justice. Um, so I would just encourage everyone to think about what are those points of contact uh, and those opportunities, those levers that you might be able to push um, to have an influence on public policy. And I'm sure that Professor O'Connor is, is doing this work and has all kinds of um, ideas that you don't um, stumble on them otherwise. Um, and beyond this kind of advocacy and activism, we may, need, we may in fact need to build something new. Those of us who participated in the Women's Committee of 100 stumbled into a very high level of engagement in the policy making process, in part because we had Patsy Mink um, as a friend and an ally. At the time, we had virtually no staff, no budget, no office space, and no apparatus, really, for communications, for promoting our ideas, or for membership development in our organization. Given these limitations, I think we did pretty well. <laughs> um, you know, 40% of the Democratic Caucus in the House of Representatives. Um, but it's not entirely surprising that we and Representative Ming succeeded only at helping to delay anti-welfare feminist uh, anti-feminist anti welfare reauthorization, and that we weren't able to change conventional understandings of how government, labor markets, and families all fit together. Bringing nuanced feminist understandings into public policy might indeed be hard work. But as Representative Mink has said, quote, we have to build things that we want to see Mary Turner from the History Department here in America. Um, I'm just curious, you know, you talked about how important elements of academic knowledge with respect to family welfare, poverty, et cetera, did not cross over into the public discourse. And I'm wondering if you can just enlighten us a bit more about uh, what did constitute and who did constitute the knowledge base for the 1996 legislation. Where did that come from? Who had the input? Who controlled it? How uh, inaccurate <laughs> was it? Um, you know, I think this, this, and this is something that Alice thinks about a lot too, and others here, about the relationship between knowledge and public policy. Yep. And uh, I'm just, you know, eager to get a little more about who, who had the, the chips. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, others in the room might also have ideas about this. Um, I, you know, in the course of writing this book, I became much more um, interested than I thought I would be, well, in ideas generally. I don't think of myself as an intellectual historian, um, but particularly in the think, the think tank industrial complex in Washington, D.C., which I think has a lot to answer for on this one. You know, and the way supposed consensus, consensuses are formed in Washington, D.C., you know. Um, uh, you know, there are feminist think tanks, there is feminist knowledge production that happens in between the academy and the world of public policy. We worked closely back in the day uh, with the Institute for Women's Policy Research in particular, which if you don't know, I think is the best um, of the feminist think tanks in DC, and they have a large um, uh, uh, network of people who at least receive their reports and, um, and use them at the state level. Um, but they are so tiny compared to um, the, some of the larger think tanks in DC, like the Brookings Institution um, and uh, the American Enterprise Institute and so on. So, um, so I think that the feminist ideas were simply drowned out um, by those other institutions. And then there also were, um, were much more kind of interested parties, like for example, um, you know, the new Democrats were uh, building out, out of the DLC, the Democratic, so-called Democratic Leadership Council, which doesn't exist anymore. You know, it was a very powerful going concern in the middle 90s, supported by um, a lot of corporate interests, um, including uh, tobacco companies and others. Um, and, and they were very actively promoting a certain kind of um, pro-corporate democratic politics 
and they were not at all, you know, they were not all interested in um, a kind of robust, um, you know, poor people's uh, approach to uh, feminism. So I think there's a real, um, I think there's a real piece missing. Even like, even at the time when we were finishing the book, right? The mainstream uh, think tanks in Washington, they totally missed uh, what was about to happen in 2016. You know, the Bernie Sanders phenomenon and the movement of the Democratic Party to the left. They had no freaking idea that any of that was coming. And there were reports being issued even then about the consensus view on poverty between Brookings and AEI. You know, it was absurd. You know, so conservative, so anti-feminist. So I think it's, I think it's, there's something particularly off about that middle sphere of foundation funded, you know, think tank, non-academic, um, and supposedly, um, supposedly not raising the political research. That's really problematic. Um, and I, I came away from this, um, from this project, really feeling like you know, even in the age of Trump, when it seems like public policy is made in 120 characters at a time, right? Like there is really a distinct role for us to play as academics, you know, who are not um, beholden to the short-term whims of uh, foundations. Right, who don't have to hustle for grants in order to do our research. You know, who can be somewhat independent and take unpopular positions and stand up for people who don't have a voice there. Right, I think we really have a role to play and that our, not, our level of knowledge production is, is distinctively important, right, in this arena. Um, you Hi, my name is Anna. I'm a graduate student in the sociology department. Um, so I'm interested in this uh, role that we have to play. I study feminist politics and policy change and contraception. And one thing that I'm wrestling with that I would love to hear your thoughts on are um, who we're accountable to in this work and who gets to define what feminist priorities are in policy reform. Um, that at one level that seems obvious at a very general level, but as you get down to the granular level as I'm discovering in my research and I know from my life, um, there's a lot of tension around what our priorities should be, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'd like to hear more of your thoughts as well. Um, uh, you know, I think it um, it depends a lot. I'm just thinking a lot about my Planned Parenthood experience. Um, it's been really interesting on our board. Um, they've been diversifying the board. That's part of how I got there. Um, I think I'm the gay voice. Um, among other things, but I think, I, I think I was brought on to be gay on the board. No, I had that handle before I got on the board. Um, you know, but they've also brought people from different kinds of backgrounds and people who are less rich uh, onto the board. There's, you know, a woman who's a, a activist in Native American communities in Northern New England who usually don't get a voice in Planned Parenthood or haven't historically. Um, a colleague of mine who. Uh, uh, father was uh, Indian and came from, she comes from an immigrant background, um, and uh, you know, a couple of African Americans who didn't used to be on the board. And so um, I guess our approach has been that, that we have to be in that conversation, right? That we can't, we don't, can't have a final answer about like who's going to be at the table and what our you know, definitive process is going to be, but we're just trying, we're trying to raise the reproductive justice challenge you know, again and again and again, and to say to our colleagues, like, this is the work. The work is to be in struggle about it, right? The work is for maybe sometime when we're meeting as a board to, to take a tour of um, Native American lands and to talk about eugenics in New England, you know, and maybe learn something about why some people think that Planned Parenthood is really problematic because of that history, you know? Um, and maybe another time we would read something together about, you know, the early 20th century, the century history of Planned Parenthood. Maybe another time we would, you know, try and get active participation from some of the communities we're trying to serve through social science methods or some other method, right? So I, I, I think it's hard to have a definitive answer, but um, what I'm encouraging, at least in that world, what I'm encouraging people to do, where it's really, really hard, you know, we're fighting against um, a federal administration that doesn't even want us to have legal abortion or access to birth control, right? So we, Got to fight that, but at the same same time, we can't just be fighting for that. We have to be in this bigger struggle, and we have to be listening to people on the ground, right, who are demanding more, um, and to whom um, the wider agenda is so uh, essential. So um, I think we just have to 
we have to be in that struggle and we have to keep asking ourselves, you know, who else can we bring in, who else can we hear from, um, instead of trying to have a kind of definitive answer about it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nelson. Uh, in the, uh, I know more on the health, the health uh, reform efforts. In both of the, uh, both the Clinton era and the Obama era, when you looked at the opposition, and you back just down below, well, really quite a on service, but it's a real cadre of the uh, opposition to uh, health reform is often anti-abortion. You know, the, the network, the whole network. And so, uh, and that's you know, even more so clear, even and obviously you can't carry it as hard, etc. But so in the in the in the well in the conservative advocacy, which of course that's been going on for decades of, of this welfare reform, who were the, was the anti-abortion uh, sort of mo movement network? Was that crucial to that? Was that central? Was central as, as as a health reformer? Where would you place that? Or is it sort of? Or is that a different question? Is that a different? Um, uh, network uh, that is pushing for the uh, the, the uh, this welfare uh, um, you know transformation. That's a good question because, like, if you think about the family cap, the family cap is you know anti-natalist. They don't want poor people yeah, yeah, to have exactly. the kids, right? And that would seem to run counter to the pro-child thing. So I guess that's where our intersectional theory comes in, right? Some people are supposed to have kids. Some people are not supposed to have kids. And um, I don't think that was explicitly articulated very much. You know, it was, it was kind of happening in two different policy realms at the same time. In the welfare context, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted poor folks certainly to get birth control and maybe quietly were perfectly fine with them having abortions as well, right? But for, for white people, you know, it's, it, it seems kind of like the early 20th century, like the politics are not that different from like a, kind of, you know, TDR politics or something. Right, right. So so that I mean that's my that's my understanding. And they also I mean but they're also operating with this kind of weird idea that somehow they could, without spending any real money on it, somehow they could coerce low income people into becoming like the Ozzy and Harriet um, families, you know, and uh, and and not you know and have fathers acting the way they think fathers should act and Mothers acting the way they stereotypically think mothers should act, and so on. So there also is a kind of quote unquote pro family, pro pro procreation um, kind of stereotype that's operative. But I think where the rubber hits the road, they're actually totally fine with black people right. and low income people not having kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, okay, I got the mic. Um, uh oh. <laughs> now, this is wonderful, of course. Uh, to the question of knowledge making and struggle with, within feminism is another component that was really important at the time. That is, while we could unify when we were arguing against the uh, Clinton era reform, nonetheless, in our group, there were some people who emphasized, as Barbara, when we went to lobby Barbara Boxer, you're going to love this bill. It's all the stuff for child care. It was a labor market vision that work sets you free. And there's a lot of feminism that feeds into that. Any kind of work as opposed to decent work or chosen work. While there are other people who were listening more to the Kensington Welfare Rights Group and the Welfare Warriors and other poor women and listening to women of color who are saying, wait a minute, we want the opportunity to mother and to parent our children. And this notion, and there was a great debate among those people who were fo focusing on valuing the labor of care and other people who are trying to figure out what policies can bring more women into the labor market and train them for even better jobs than caring jobs, for example. So that tension, I think, it's not that, it, I would argue at that moment of 94, 95, 96, didn't undermine our efforts of pushing back uh, on the Clinton welfare reform. But it did show that 
how the dominant strands of liberal feminism in the country, and most of us didn't define ourselves that way, uh, who were involved in the Women's Committee 100, uh, opened the door for these work first, or at least, I won't say that we have the power to open the door, but, but had a very problematic relationship to those people focused on wage, labor, at any cost. So that's one, one comment. And the other comment I wanted, uh, and, and so many of those people did not, were really not happy with our immodest proposal uh, as, as much as we would have hoped. And the other thing I would like your impression, in the women's marches, if you listen to the speeches, people were talking about intersectionality. You know, there were you know, millions of people marching you know, for the last few years. And I actually heard something different. I heard the impact of our feminist studies, our women and gender studies, sexuality studies classrooms, mm -hmm. and the reproductive justice movement into this mass audience. Mm -hmm. Now, what people take away from hearing that, of course, is another thing. Mm -hmm. But that gives me some hope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, me too. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, uh, the thing I'll say about the, the, the debates among feminism, I think that's true, and both liberal and socialist feminisms um, have that tendency to think about um, supporting people who work in the labor market. And, uh, and many of my academic feminist colleagues also um, you know, have that position. And, as I recall, within the Women's Committee, actually, there was a lot of debate. And the Yamada's proposal accommodates women's wage labor as well as their unwaged caregiving precisely for that reason. Um, one of our colleagues used to say, is Newt Gingrich a closet feminist? Uh, because he was promoting labor market participation for women, right? And as a provocation, but still, I think, you know, people were talking about that. Um, so I think it is a matter of debate, and I think that's one of the things that um, one of the things that we learn when we make ourselves accountable to low-income communities and when we when we work with, you know, read the writings of, et cetera, women who actually receive public assistance, you know, who say, sure, I want a job if it's a decent job and if my kids are safe, right? Um, but those conditions have to be met, right? And I'm not going to just go work in somebody's kitchen or clean somebody's house. You're paid for taking you know, Care right, or just take, take care of the children of another woman who used to receive public assistance but now has to, you know, go out to work. Right, there are a lot of people who say that um, taking care of my own children might be a better or a more valuable social contribution that I could make, right? And sometimes, for, for self-identified feminists, sometimes that's hard to hear. You know, my mom always told me that I, you know, had to get out of the house and get a job. Um, and uh, and so sometimes that's hard to hear as a feminist position, right? A pro motherhood kind of position. But I think, yeah, those of us you know who have worked with people who call themselves welfare rights activists, for example, um, and who have received public aid and who have had crappy jobs and who know how bad the labor market can be, um, I think we have to be willing to understand that point of view as well. Uh, Oh, no, I don't want to. Um, so, Felicia, thank you for a, a great talk, and I really, I think, the, you know, the point you end on is an incredibly important one because it presents the challenge to us. I mean, I kind of want to echo what Eileen said when she said she's hearing intersectionality, although, quite frankly, I don't think I would necessarily give the credit to the academics for that. No, I, I, I give the credit. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's people who are, it's the people who are speaking their lives. I mean, intersectionality <coughs> makes sense, right? And, um, and, but I also think um, it does point to uh, one of the things that was heartening uh, in, the, in the last election is that um, there are more people who are not people of wealth who've gotten elected. Um, and I do think, you know, part of, part of this story is this just massive class divide, mm -hmm. and which is which is a, an intersectional class divide um, that 
first of all, it means electing more people who can, you know, walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Um, but it also has to do with the, I think, the tension between what goes on in movement politics and what goes on in policy politics. Because, you know, very often some of these ideas that spring out of movements um, then get translated by the policy types into the kinds of provisions that actually don't reflect what the, what the movement folks are asking for. Anyway, I wanted to just get your thoughts about a kind of tension, not just class as well as there's other kinds of tension between some of the fantastic things that are coming out of movement politics right now um, and that policy wonk politics that just seem to be continuing to be um, yeah, I think that's another big, so I, I was focusing on the gulf between um, what we know, sometimes know, in the academy and what goes out of Washington. I think that's another, that's another big gulf between what's going on in activist movements and what's going on in Washington. And I don't know, um, you know, policy knowledge, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to the converted a little bit on this because some of my colleagues here um, have been working on you know, ideas of policy, policy knowledge for a long time. But policy knowledge, it does seem like kind of a hard nut to crack. It's sort of a, it's sort of a, its own bubble to a remarkable degree. Um, and I don't quite know what it requires to, to, to break that bubble. Um, uh, one of the things I did in the past, in addition to working on Capitol Hill for this committee called the Committee for Children, Youth, and Families, which was itself trying to do some bridging work between the research world and Capitol Hill. We, uh, that committee, um, it wasn't one of the committees that actually um, gets to authorize any legislation or mark up any legislation, um, but it was an advisory kind of committee. So I did that and I also worked at the Institute for Policy Studies, which is the furthest to the left of the think tanks in DC. Um, but IPS is incredibly marginal in Washington. It doesn't really participate in debates. And I think even the Institute for Women's Policy Research and the other feminist think tanks, they're really not in the mainstream conversation, whereas some of the, main, the mainstream players are like so wealthy and well-funded. And the, the, the kinds of ideas and research they produce just seem so crazy sometimes relative to what's going on in America. You know, at the time of escalating inequality and vast poverty and you know, incredible homelessness, you know, they were still talking about the success of welfare reform, you know, the wonders of political consensus and so on, you know, when the Trump, the Trump movement and the Bernie movement are happening at the same time and they're talking about the wonders of consensus. Um, so I think there is there is a real divide there and, you know, the, the movements, the movements are forcing them to grow up a little bit. And it's, you know, like there's a lot of talk about criminal justice reform now by everybody and that's because of Black Lives Matter. You know, it really is. It didn't come from didn't come from any policy player at all. It came all from the bottom up.